Hi everyone, so happy to be here with you guys today. We have a very, very special guest and I'm so excited for you to know more about Becky Overbeck. Hey Becky. Thank you, Randy. Thank so you for having me. Here. So Thank happy you're here. So happy you're here. So let me tell you a little bit about Becky. She is, I think you have this on your website, as an extremely passionate Canadian fitness professional mm -hmm. and mom of three. Yes, ma'am. All, all very important parts of your life. Definitely. Definitely. And you have hundreds and thousands of followers over social media and more than 4 million views on TikTok and other platforms, which is amazing and an international community that loves whatever you do. <laughs> Most but, of the time. Yeah, <laughs> well, we're gonna talk about that. Yep. But it wasn't always this way. No. One of, I noticed what you wrote, is that it's been one hell of a journey to get to this point. Jay, your husband, yes. and I were uh, saying how happy our newly married 18 and 20 year old selves would be to see how far we've come yes <laughs> and how grateful we are for these incredible humans we get to call our daughters georgia daisy and sophie yes. and i have met them and they are incredible <laughs> trust me so um you face all sorts of crushing challenges um and yet here you are as an inspiration to so many. And can we start at the beginning? Can you tell us a little about your early years? Yeah. Growing up and your background is so fascinating and <laughs> in contrast to where you are right now. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, yes, so I was born, um, I'm the seventh child. Um, we were born in this little tiny town in Northern Ontario called New Whiskers. And wow, I could never ever have expected to get to where we are today. Um, so from New Liskard, we lived in North Bay, all around Northern Ontario. Um, I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and um, brought up in a very kind of strict religious home. My parents were in their 40s when they had me because I was the youngest of seven. So in many ways, it was like almost being raised like my grandparents. Um, yeah, so my dad, when he was younger, was a police, police officer and he was in the military. So very, very strict upbringing. And between that and the religion, it was a very tough, tough childhood. Um, as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, there's a lot of rules, and <laughs> what would I give, say? Give us an example of some of the rules mm -hmm. um, that, yeah. that you dealt with as, as a young child and growing up. And, right. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty much everything from what you wore, so your clothing. Um, so when, when I would pick out a dress at the store, and this was right until I got married, um, my dad would say, bend over, and it would be to make sure that the dress wasn't too short in the back. So that if I bent over and I'd touch my toes. Oh, wow. Yeah, bend that, over. That's the rule, you have to touch your toes? So bend over, touch your toes. So we'd even be shopping at the store. Uh -huh. And it would be bend over, touch your toes, and make sure that the dress isn't too short in the back, right? So weird. Anyway, uh, so making sure that clothing was modest. So wearing a slip and long skirts, long dresses, covering up you know, any kind of cleavage or anything. Um, what else? Uh, hair. So hair has to be a very natural color. You can't stand out too much. So you can't dye your hair like if you wanted to have pink highlights or purple highlights or whatever. So nothing like that. No tattoos, um, no crop tops. Mm -hmm. um, let me think. There's just so many. It's you, So you're not allowed to do yoga, which we just recently been able to do with Randy and Dave. Um, no Christmas, so you can't celebrate Christmas, Halloween, Valentine's, uh, your birthday is, you can't celebrate your birthday. So celebrating was not a right. big deal. Like no. that whole 
impetus to joy was not something that was very supported no. within the community. Right. Or any kind of like having passion for something. You know, it was more so just uh, the most important thing growing up was reading the Bible, studying our watchtower in awake, uh, which is the Jehovah's Witness literature, uh, your tracks and your magazines, and then going door to door, so knocking at people's doors. So this was the most important thing in our lives. Uh, so any kind of like fun or dance or television or um, hobbies always took, you know, back seat, way back seat. It was always your focus should be on God. So from a very young age, I enjoyed fitness. I loved to watch Jane Fonda and dancing, and it seemed so fun. But when you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses, it's, it, you're told that um, fitness is only beneficial for little. And so to not put any kind of major importance on it. So you had this spark, you had mm -hmm. this, you know, this passion for resonance yeah. with fitness, with mm -hmm. being al feeling alive and yeah. all of that. And that was not supported no. in your community. And yet, and yet you went on to open yeah. a gym with your husband. Yes. Was that like a radical act in itself or? It was a tiptoe into it. Uh -huh. So I put fitness in the back seat as I was, you know, encouraged to do. Um, By the way, yes. let me ask you, were you like a natural people pleaser? Was oh, that? Yeah. That is what Jehovah's Witness children, you're from the moment, they call it inculcating. Uh -huh. So we would call it brainwashing. Some people call it inculcation. Yes. Whatever. So it's yes, mom, yes, dad. Whoever is older than you, your senior, is yes, yes. Whatever they ask of you, it's yes. Mm -hmm. And you don't, um, you don't disagree. You don't say no. Voice your own opinion. Oh no, no, no. You don't question it. Yeah. You just do it. Mm -hmm. So my whole childhood, and again, that's where I say my father being not only a police officer in the military plus the religion it was like extra yes dad yes mom mm -hmm. and if you didn't watch out there was some discipline so anyway back to fitness mm -hmm. <laughs> um yeah so putting it on in the back seat having our three children focusing on the bible focusing on being a good you know jehovah's witness and a good wife and um but tell us a little bit about the roles between men and women and, yeah. and also the power dynamics. Oh, look at that face, oh mm. my gosh. Yeah. It never sat well yeah. with me, you know? Yeah. And my mother was the most, she was so strong-willed in so many areas, but when it came to submission mm. to men, she was so, what's the word, passive? like. Mm -hmm whatever your father says, be submissive. And she would tell me that, you know. Actually those words, be, oh, be submissive? Be, be submissive. submissive. Oh my gosh. Uh, over and over. And I would just, you know, so when Jay and I got married, I was only 18 and he was 20. And he would say something. He was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses as well. And in a very strict home. And so he took his role very seriously. So I'm 18 and we're at our meeting. And I like a mint or I like to chew gum and our meetings are like two hours long. Uh -huh. So I remember one meeting, my husband, and I we still bring it up to this day, he stuck his hand in front of my mouth like this. So you should spit my gum out. And I just looked at him like, What are you doing? Yeah. I looked at him right. And there was other times where he'd say about my clothing, like it wasn't as modest as it should be. And, my mom would just keep saying, Rebecca, be submissive. He is the head of the household. Wow. And another thing that witnesses say is that women are to render the due. If you can guess what that means. So render the due. Render the due. So it's whether you feel like it or not, mm. um, you are to, you know, do your due. So <laughs> please your husband and you don't want to give him any reason to look at another woman or because it might it'll tend to be your fault if you don't oh my. render the do wow. yeah <laughs> i i can't imagine you know our kids growing up in that kind of environment 
I could never say those words to my daughter. Yeah. I could never tell my children to be that way. Can you share that story about, mm -hmm. you know, a child? Yes. Yeah. So another thing growing up is um, you're not supposed to be very self-confident. Like, um, the more, I guess, self-conscious you are, you know, shoulders down. Yeah, and, make yourself small. Mm -hmm. um, so after I had our three daughters, and there's beautiful blonde hair girls, and one's got blue eyes, and the others have big brown eyes, and, and they're passionate as well, and outgoing, and my father was over visiting one day, and we were sitting at our dining room table, and he's at one end, mm -hmm. and I'm at the other, and I'd be in my 30s, and I still have never st stood up to my father. It was always, yes, dad right and so my father looked at me and he said so I want you to make sure that the girls never know how beautiful they are mm. and oh my gosh. yeah and so I stood oh up on my chair uh, looking straight at my father I stood up on my chair I got up much taller than he was sitting and I just said my girls will always know how beautiful they are. I will always make sure they know how strong they are and powerful they are. Beautiful. High five for that. Yes. yes. And he just sat there and looked at me. So that was actually the first time that you mm -hmm. spoke up with that inner voice. Did you did you know where that came from? Because no that idea. <laughs> He was telling Randy, I was like, I don't even know what made me get up and stand on a chair. Yeah, that is really something deep inside of you said, no more. Yeah. And maybe that was coming from, you know, your mama bear kind mm. of thing. Like, nobody will tell my girls to diminish themselves. Yeah. And I think for us, like, it's one thing for us to be told to do something and we just do it. You know, but when it comes to our children, yeah, that's a whole nother level. That's a and I think, yeah, I was used to it being imposed upon me. I think I was used to that. Yeah. And then here it was, my dad saying this to me about my daughters. And I was like, oh, <gasps> yeah, yeah, that. And how did he react to that? I think that my mother was in the kitchen. And I think it was dinner time. Like, I think she was preparing something in the kitchen. And I think she came in at that moment and just kind of like put some water on the fire. Yeah. She doused it out. Yeah. Yeah. Before it could get any bigger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You also mentioned a time when, I mean, we're talking about right now, mm. focusing on your breaking free from, let's say, mm -hmm. call it the conditioning yes. or the, the, the trance of obedience or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a time when you were in a room with two of the elders. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about that custom. Yes. Yeah. So growing up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, we would go to weekly meetings. So there was about three meetings each week. So it'd be Sunday morning, Tuesday evening, and Thursday evening. So each meeting was about two hours. And then you go and you sit there and you listen and a man speaks from the stage, uh, kind of like a church, I guess. I've never been in a church, so ours was called the Kingdom Hall. So the man talks and um, you sit there two hours and then you get to go home. Um, but on some evenings, you would be called into the back room. Some people would call it the second school. So the main auditorium would be your first school. And then this little room was called your second school. It could be the elders room whatever they want to call it okay so from a very young age my very first memory of having an elders meeting is i was probably about 12 or 13 years of age and they would have like a congregation get together they don't call them parties but they call them get togethers where they'll go and they'll have like a potluck and and talk and okay so maybe someone will play guitar um so there was one of these evenings and we were there and i'm a t young teenager and I was dancing so there was music and I was dancing and were there a lot of people dancing a couple people yeah a couple people were dancing so I'm dancing and so the next meeting the next one uh, two elders came up and said we need to discuss something mm -hmm. so this was my first memory of an elders meeting 
So I get pulled back into the back room and they s begin to in insinuate that I've been drinking alcohol. There was no other reason I could be dancing. That I must have somehow <coughs> someone gave me alcohol, so I must have been drinking. And I said, no, I wasn't drinking at all. Well, are you sure you weren't drinking? I said, I was not drinking, I was having fun, I was dancing. And if you know me, you know who I am, and I love to dance and have fun, and that never has just never changed. I don't need alcohol to be fun. Yeah. Um, so they weren't used to that. So that was my first, and it almost becomes an interrogation. Mm. And you're you're guilty until proven innocent. Mm. So through the years, this would be it could be over your skirt was too short. So your skirts are supposed to be past the knee. Your top's too low. Uh, what you follow on social media. They're checking, they click on who you're following. They check who you're following on social media. So if they click on following and you are following something they don't feel is appropriate, it could be movies that you chose to watch, um, music that you listen to, what you posted on social media. So there's such a wide variety mm -hmm. of things you could be called into an elders meeting for. So the one that Randy's speaking of was the last elders meeting I was ever in. So I was about 37 years of age and I was being pulled in for, it was probably something I wore or something I posted on social media. And they are asking me questions, interrogating me again. Why would you do this? Why, we've been told you shouldn't wear this or you're stumbling others. That's a big one, you're stumbling others. And so I'm sitting there, and this is already after a two-hour meeting where I've already sat for two hours, and my kids are waiting out for me outside the room. And I, after about 20 minutes, I just picked up my bag, and I said, I have to go now. I'm going now. We're done. And they looked at me, and they're like, well, where are you going? They, I don't know if people have ever done this. Yeah, I don't know. If I, I, I would suspect, <laughs> not that I have any way of knowing, mm -hmm. but from what you're saying, I would suspect that you were yeah. the first. I think, in that especially group. a woman. Yeah, yeah. So I just I stood up and I said, "I'm leaving, and we're done, and I don't want to talk about this anymore." So what what was your thinking? Um, how did you come to that? I think because I realized we're not getting anywhere. Nothing's being solved. I'm not going to change. Mm -hmm. You're not going to change. <laughs> so what is arguing going to do? Yeah, more. Plus yeah. you had your kids waiting for you. My kids yeah. are waiting for me. And it, again, this was 37 years wow. of just, yes, 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 your, yes, dad, yes, mom, yes, yes, elders, yes, everybody. Right? Right. Never being able to just be your authentic self. So it's almost as though you realize that there's nothing holding you here. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And you, you looked at things with fresh eyes mm -hmm. like I have the freedom <laughs> to I have the right and the ability to get up and leave a situation that doesn't make sense to me doesn't make sense I could yeah. almost imagine like in a cartoon where those big like cuffs yeah. those shackles are on and it's all of a sudden like they just went yeah. and they popped open I was like oh I can leave and there's this story that you may know about <laughs> the elephants mm -hmm. uh, when their babies you know they're tied up with a, a cord mm -hmm. that is a deterrent that would keep them from escaping but when they grow up they're so used to this cord they don't realize that they are so strong they yeah. they could just take one step and break the cord but they they don't do it because no. it, it doesn't come to mind so that they, was it's maybe, been inculcated into yeah them. inculcated yeah <laughs> so that was uh, another mm -hmm. big step in your freedom. Yeah. And um, what happened um, that really made sealed you, the deal? Yes, yeah, sealed the deal. Mm -hmm. So after having these elders meetings and I guess not conforming mm -hmm. enough, I was really like, if you know me from a young girl, I am so respectful and I am, I try to be modest and I try to be not people pleasing, but like I try to be good. I try really hard. And I think everyone who really knows me knows that. And so I was trying so hard in the religion 
to do everything, to study my magazines, read the Bible, get my kids to the meetings on time, dress appropriately. Um, you know, I was trying so hard to be how they wanted me to be. And so this is what blew my mind was we got to the meeting one night. So this is, I'm 37-ish years old. We sit down. So I've got my three daughters, my husband. And not only that, as a witness, when we go knocking door to door, you're encouraged to bring people with you mm -hmm. from, from your neighborhood, right? Or who you talk to. So we even had one of those ladies with us that night. And so we sit down and the man gets up on the platform and he says, tonight we need to have a discussion about someone in our congregation who puts fitness ahead of God. Now, in our congregation, that's only me. <laughs> no one else, no one else even puts any importance on health or exercise. And it was my business, it was my job. Um, I owned it, we owned a gym, and we taught fitness classes. And so the man proceeds to say that I am not a good example for others that, um, yeah, uh, he went on, it was about a half an hour talk and he wouldn't use my exact name. He just listed, he listed every characteristic of me and then ended with, we encourage you to no longer have any association with this person. And so I'm looking at my husband, I'm looking at my daughters and my study who's with us. And she is just so turned off. She never came back, mm. right? And here's another point. I wish I would have stood up during that. I wish I would have stood up and just said, what is going on? What are you doing? I didn't have the brave, I didn't have the courage to do it at that point. Um, oh, you were probably so shocked. So shocked to be, you know, uh, like highlighted in, mm. in that way in front of. Yes. Actually, it's like shame. Yes. You know, in front of your whole community, your family. Like. So normally, what they'll do is it's called a disfellowshipping, and a disfellowshipping is when you've done something really against their rules. So it could be adultery, it could be fornication, it could be, you know. Uh, something very very serious and if that's the case they'll actually say your name and say so-and-so was disfellowship mm -hmm. and if that happens you can't even speak to them you can't hug them and this goes even if it's your child your spouse your grandmother your best friend it doesn't matter your sibling like that's it it's done until they repent and come back and that can take years decades so because I hadn't done anything worth it not worth but i didn't do anything that was that bad mm -hmm. right so they couldn't disfellowship me so this was their way of shunning shunning of shaming me and my girls and i talk about it it's like the modern day burning of the witch mm -hmm. so back in the day they would actually you know burn the witch uh anyone who was was um close to animals, anyone who was um, into plant medicine or whatever. Yes, yeah. anything like that. Yeah. Uh, so back in the day, that's what they would do. And in these days, they'll do these public shamings. And so we sat there, we sat through the whole thing. And being a people pleaser I am, we continued to go to our meetings even after that for a little while. How did you feel? Awful. And my husband and my girls, everyone would talk to them, but no one would look or talk to me. They would say to them, oh, it's so nice to see you. It's so nice to have you. They even said, do you want to come to the beach on the weekend? But if Becky comes, she has to wear a one piece. And my husband said, um, my wife doesn't own a one piece and I don't tell my wife what to wear. And no, we won't be joining you at the beach. Um, so there was so many little things like but that. But they couldn't look at you in the Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, no. They couldn't right. look at me or talk to me. And, and even your own parents? So that's where I finally kind of said to my husband, I don't feel good going anymore. It's not encouraging. It's, it actually is the epitome of mentally draining. and It's like it's a bad, it's a horrible feeling. 
it almost feels like bullying, you know? Almost. It almost feels like almost. bullying. Yeah. And so I just said, I don't feel like I want to go anymore, and I don't want to discourage you and the girls from going, so please keep going if you want to keep going. And so they did for a little while. I would stay back, and they went. But they just, they felt they started to feel the same thing as me. This isn't a good place anymore. It doesn't feel it wasn't loving. positive in no. any way, shape, or form. And so they stopped going. And now all five of us after our, we spent a whole lifetime, this was our whole life. And this is where we started kind of realizing, okay, we've spent this many years of our life this way. What if we started celebrating fun things? And so it was, it was Christmas time. We'd never celebrated Christmas before. And so we bought this little tiny tree about this big. And it was like tiptoeing, you know? And with this little tree, and I'd always, since I was a child, loved the twinkle lights and the little beautiful little balls. I don't even know if they're called still to this day. What are those balls called? The ornaments. Ornaments. Yeah. So we picked out a few ornaments and the Christmas lights are next to our fireplace. It's so beautiful. And my oldest daughter was, she was so excited. She had baked some cookies that looked like reindeer. And she took a picture of the cookies against the tree. And you could barely tell it was a Christmas tree, but you could see the twinkling. She posted it on her social media. And the next morning we woke up and we had a text from my mother. And she said, I see that you're celebrating Christmas now. And she said, I hope you know how disappointed God is with you. They call him Jehovah. I hope you know how disappointed Jehovah is with you and that you've lost his blessing and life is going to be very hard for me for you now. And she said, uh, please do not text, visit, or call ever again. And not only did she send that text to me, she sent that to Georgia as well, our oldest daughter. And I said, I love you, mother. I knew that was, that I knew that was a possibility that that could happen. So I just told her I loved her very much and that I will always, 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 always be here if she ever needed anything. Just Away. We lived about an hour and a half apart at the time. And I was there like every weekend. Every weekend I'd bring them groceries. I would pick up their supplements. I would clean their home. Dutiful daughter. It's the way you were raised. Mm -hmm. You know, respect your parents, love your parents, take care of your parents. So that's what I was doing. And then all of a sudden, and she was, she would be the one I would, if I saw a beautiful bird, I, she would be the one I would text right away. I would take a picture and text that picture I heard a song she loves my best friend and so to get that text from her was I mean that was the part that nobody thinks about you know on, on the road to independence and claiming yourself. the sacrifices yeah and the, and the feelings of um, mm. loss um, it's hard to from that if they're the ones that are mm -hmm. pushing you away. Yes, and it wasn't just that we were losing her and my dad, it was my five brothers, my sister, their 20 grandchildren, my sister-in-laws. So every, our whole life was like a rug just ripped out, you know? And I know I made choices that, I know I made choices that made that happen as well. So I do take some ownership of this, but at the same time, I don't agree with it. I don't agree with... Your choices were being true yes. to your inner self, mm -hmm. your, your heart, to be aligned with the authentic spirit inside of you rather mm -hmm. than the dogma that you were surrounded with yes. growing up. And that's, it's very brave, and it's very hard, I think, yeah. to do. But they will always say, if you would just, if you would have just kept being, Observe. if you would have just kept being like that, you'd still have your family, you'd still have your brothers and sisters, you'd still have your friends, so it's your fault, is what you're told. And for a long while, I felt that way, I was like, well, if I had just... What, what released you? Um, again, I think it's seeing other people go through it and 
watching like how wrong it is yeah. that somebody can be treated this way, that a parent, that a sibling can just disown you for having a love of fitness or for who you love or what you love. Yeah. Um, and it's or not for wanting to, to be full in the line. Yes. You know? Yeah. You want to Rather celebrate than something. Follow a certain yeah. dog. It was one of my nieces that um, I don't want to share her story until she's ready, but it's something she went through. And I think seeing her go through it and the sacrifices she's had to make some really big sacrifices. And but today, mm -hmm. you know, you are out there. You are a voice. Mm -hmm. You are someone that tells your story mm -hmm. from from the heart, from the you're using that to inspire other people. When you do get disfellowshipped or when you leave the religion, you are not supposed to speak about it. So you're supposed to repent, so change, mm -hmm. and go back to living the way you were, mm -hmm. and you'll be uh, reinstated. But that was not going to be an option for me. I wasn't, I had just finally broken free. I wasn't about to put those shackles back on. Right. And so if you do speak out about it, not only are you shamed or shunned or disfellowshipped, it's now a next, the next level is called apostate. And that is how, that's the word they would use to speak about me. And so one day, I think a lot of people were wondering why I wasn't posting pictures of my mom or with my mom because we were best friends. Everybody knew that. We were such a close family. And so one day after one of our fitness classes, I sat in our gym in Ontario, it was the first video I've ever made about this and my head was held like I look at it now and I'm like oh my gosh my heart God. but I'm sitting there just like this kind of telling the story and so many people just said thank you for talking about it thank you for talking about it and you're our voice and please don't stop and so I think I just took them on as kind of like um, a way I can help people. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, it, so many are too afraid. They're too afraid to speak about it because you then, so once you become an apostate, you literally can't come back from that. Mm -hmm. I'm gone, like in their term, you know, I'm yeah. too far gone. Yeah. So my mom has passed away. My dad is soon to pass away. I have nothing left to prove. Yeah. Oh, you have so much in your heart to give. Yeah. You know, that's the thing. But they've already taken. They've yeah. taken everything. Yeah. They've taken it all. I have nothing left to lose. To lose. Yeah. I have a ton to gain. And you have a ton to offer people mm -hmm. and to inspire people. Yeah. And already we see from from the people that approach you yeah. on social media that your voice it is like a voice in, in a desert for yeah. so many just because too many, so many are just too afraid to speak out. And I, I, I just want to mention that your background is, you know, the particular religion that you grow, grew up yeah. with. But for so, yeah. there are many I know. religions, there are many you know, systems of yeah. thinking yeah. that in effect oppress mm -hmm. people. Yes. And, and and keep them small. Even relationships, even, you know, absolutely. married couples, partners, where it's the same kind of... It's the power dynamic, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I hope that you can see that you are such a powerful and heartfelt voice for so many people. It's not a matter of your religion. It's yeah. a matter of any human yeah. that wants to you know, break free from the confines, yes. from the entrapment of, of any system of thought that would keep them small and, yeah. and misaligned yes. with their own true purpose, with their own 
heart with their own intuition, you know, you oh. smash that down. In our, in our publications, it would even say, like, in print, do not follow your heart because your heart will lead, lead you astray. And I have told Randy, where I'm, that just ran away was a red light to me. It was a red flag, like, no, no, no. If there's one thing I know for sure, it's to follow your heart, your intuition, listen to your gut. Absolutely, absolutely. And what would you advise, you know, your best friend or your right. daughter, you who yeah. want them to, you know, to live an expansive yeah. and yes. vibrant life? Yeah. I mean, that's what we're talking about. You actually reinvented yourself. Yes. Because of circumstances. Totally. You know? And and with that, you have a whole new life yes. that's going on now. A life I can't even believe. A um, few years ago, would you even no. have thought that <laughs> I still this pinch was myself. possible? I still pinch myself all the time. Uh, and I talk about how much we've had to sacrifice and give up and we have nothing to lose. Um, the flipping of the script of yeah, we lost so much. We lost so much. But at the on the other side of it is how much we've gained. We've gained so, so much. We've gained uh, unconditional love by people we've met, friends, new friends we've made. We've been able to travel. We've been able to, I've been able to see my girls become so confident and not cocky, but so confident. And uh, they're just like empowered women who are now kind of following in my footsteps yes. and, and in their own ways. They're so creative. And yeah. And, and, and they're happy. Yes. They're happy and they, they get have to have a spark in their eyes. Yeah, and they get to wear what they like. They get to dye their hair pink if they want. They get to uh, Daisy got a little tattoo that says Ohana, which means family in Hawaiian. All these things they would never have been able to do before. That's significant because you are creating, you know, new um, supportive uh, expansive yes. family yes. experience as compared to what you and so many people mm -hmm. who are in these oppressive systems yeah. have to deal with when uh, so Jay and I have done videos about that where Jay and I had to relearn how to parent because we were imitating our parents mm -hmm. and it was the Say yes, mom. Yes, dad. Don't question it. Don't question me. Be respectful. And then one day, Jay said to me, "Can you imagine if if we did what our girls did? Like, say they say they um, they did something, and and I told them otherwise, and they didn't say yes, mom. Yeah. Cause he said, could you imagine what our parents would have done? And I said, yeah, but the thing is, that's not. It doesn't make it right. Just because our parents did it a certain way." doesn't mean it was the right way. They did the best they could, the best they exactly. knew how to do. Exactly, that's so true. So relearning yeah. how to parent. Um, and also, when we were little, we always had that fear of getting disfellowshipped, yeah. getting uh, disowned by our parents. And that feeling, my children will never know. They'll never have to know that feeling. That's called unconditional. Jehovah's Witnesses don't know what unconditional love is. They only know um, love and friendship if you live the same way, believe the same way, act the same way. And if you don't, then it's disowned. Exactly. Imagine living under the threat mm -hmm. of being disowned from your family if you don't conform. Yes. And that creates a lot of, they call it a double life, um, where you're one way, say at school, and mm -hmm. then another way at the, the Kingdom Hall because you so want to wear that cute crop top or you so want to wear lipstick or cute whatever, but then you know if, you're, if it's seen, you will be disowned. So then you act one way at home, one way at school, and but if you get caught, you're constantly worried about it. Yeah. So now you're you're experiencing a whole 
new life. Yes. Um, you're so I don't know effusive and mm -hmm. full of life and vitality, and you inspire other people to to do the same. Yes. I want to ask you if you had three things mm -hmm. that you would advise, you know, our, our listeners mm -hmm. about empowering mm -hmm. their lives, uh, coming into alignment with yeah. themselves in a very deep way. Mm -hmm. The biggest one is to follow your heart because I feel from such a young age, I knew what my path should be. I knew it. But like we say, like an onion has so many layers. It's like that conditioning just keeps putting more and more layers on us. And so when you get to a certain age, and I think it causes a lot of depression and anxiety and stress on people when they're not living. Self-doubt. Mm -hmm. The bird. When they're not living how they really want to live. So I would say uh, try to strip those layers back off go back to listen to your intuition, mm -hmm. that inner voice that we all have, follow your heart, like sit in, in quiet. And I would say for me, that's the beach. Go to a place where you feel your most happy, your most peaceful, mm -hmm. and just try not to have too many distractions around and really think about the things that make you happy. I know a lot of people will ask, what makes you happy? What, when are you your most happy? And they, they can't even answer that question. They don't even know. Um, so instead of constantly doing what we're told to do, take some quiet time and think about what you really want for your life. And um, so follow your heart, that's number one. Listen to your intuition. Surround yourself with really good people. Um, and you'll know who those people are because when you are done spending time with them, you feel happier, you feel more peaceful, you feel energized. energized. It just feels good. Whereas if you leave some people and they drain you of your energy and you feel like, why did I just waste <laughs> that time with them? Um, so be conscious of who you're spending your time with, surrounding yourself with. And the third, I would maybe for somebody who wants to reinvent mm. themselves to, you know, that they were at a certain place in their lives, but there's some longing yeah. inside of themselves, that there's more, but they don't, maybe they could. I think fear holds so many of us back from living our authentic lives. We're afraid of what people will think of us. We're afraid of failing. And I would say, if you follow your heart, it won't lead you astray, and it will most likely lead you in the direction you were always supposed to go in the first place. So try not to let hold uh, fear hold you back. Um, yeah, face everything and rise. When I think of fear, that's what I yes. say. Face everything and rise. Thank you, Pitbull. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's that's fantastic, and uh, you are here. You're on social media mm -hmm. all the time. Yes. And uh, what is the best way? Because I know that this message will resonate with so many people. What is the best way for them to reach out to you and to get in touch with you? You can contact me on Instagram. You can contact me on Facebook, TikTok, YouTube. You can email me. I answer all of my messages. It's just me. So, um, and I've made a, a conscious effort to always respond to every single message. That's always very important to me. So I will respond, so feel free to message. Okay. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I just wanna thank you yes, so you much. Are. Well, g give, give people one, one, like spell it out so mm -hmm. that we can, uh, I mean, we'll put it in, we'll put oh, it like in. Oh, like an yeah. Instagram? Yeah. So almost, you can find me on almost every platform. I tried to make it really uh, simple, it's just Becky, B-E-C-K-Y, and our last name is Overbeck, O-V-E-R-B-E-C-K, um, and sometimes it has fitness at the end, so F-I-T-N-E-S-S. -S. Beautiful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. <laughs>
They say you meet people. So much. They say you meet people for uh, a reason. I know I'm not.